<laughs> good morning. Okay. Can you see the board okay? Uh, yeah. All right, good deal. I'm going to mute you so you it's can't ruin a lecture. Okay. That'll be perfect because God knows who will come in here. I just thought. Yeah, I don't know yet. John, you look over my lab. That's another thing. Glad you talk about long for yeah. long. What do we do? That, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, no, that's the trick. <laughs> Is the syllabus in the or is the website? So. Oh, no, just, of course not. Well, then, what, what, get all that he tells you to go oh, to right. um, like the Mac hard drive. Uh, it's on the hard drive. You can Google it. Google it. It's a web page. Yeah, it's a web He thinks it's software that's loaded on the computer. Simulations online. We just pick two and describe them each one again. That's what it says. That's not at all what the syllabus says, but I'm asking you why specifically that's what he says. So I have a thing we'll do two, and then we'll do like six more. But he told me you do two simulations, lab up those, and then you do two labs that are actual experiments. Oh, but they'll be later this semester. So I'll figure it out when we find it. I just. Once he's speaking, once he's supposed to come back, I'm not turning anything. I don't have anything he wants. I mean, he's got next week's work because the week he's not going to be here. But his baby was born yesterday, so. What? Yeah. Oh, I got two. Tomorrow? Yes. Which you get that for? Here you go, what? Oh, I got that. What? <laughs> well, I mean, he gave, he gave two seconds. He had one that he wanted to give today. I think that's today. It's just that. What's the most nice job? Yeah. But I mean, that's a bigger section. I think you got it. Well, I mean, I mean, two weeks of went back to the end of the world and they didn't get it to him. Still, yeah. The same for you, you like the same. Who wants your letter? Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't gone on. Oh, I It's real.
So how much is it? Really? Oh, okay. The thing that you download the other thing is pretty solved. You got more? Um, it's one of the main after. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I just like. Yeah. I just. just yeah. 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 Y
Okay. Questions before we start? All right. Um, so let's see. Last time we uh, were talking about plane waves. And uh, we pointed out that if we were describing the plane wave using a complex wave disturbance function, as indicated by the tilt sign on top, then that means that you would write an amplitude and then a uh, part that has the phase expressed in it, k dot r, minus or plus omega t. Epsilon, where the k dot r part for a plane wave, k dot r is a constant. For any point center located in the plane, taking the dot product between the propagation vector and any point in the plane. Give us the same constant value. Uh, uh, this sign here is suggesting that uh, this plane wave is traveling in the plus x, plus y, and plus z directions with the minus sign. <laughs> and the epsilon here, the phase angle. only takes on meaning when we have to make a relative comparison, i.e. compare the wave disturbance to another wave uh, or compare the disturbance to some coordinate system that we attach to it. That's the only time that uh, phase angle will take on meaning. Or, we could use a real function, for example, sine of k dot r minus omega t plus epsilon as well, and the same is true with cosine since both are harmonic functions. Uh, sine and cosine only differ by the value of this epsilon, zero of the sine and pi over two for cosine function. So these, both of these then, satisfy the three-dimensional differential wave equation, where we reviewed the last time the significance or the meaning of this symbol here, the Laplace. A symbol that tells us the operation we want to take is that of a second derivative squared side by dx squared, for example, plus d squared side by dy squared, <coughs> d squared side by dz squared, taking those partial derivatives. So that's what we did last time. However, if we're using a spherical coordinate system to characterize the wave disturbance, then of course it's natural to ask how is it that the wave disturbance is different or represented in the case of a spherical coordinate system. Well, that was our starting point uh, when I said that the plane wave comes from the fact that we're looking at the wave disturbance when the observer or the detector is very far away from the source of the disturbance. 
And so for the spherical wave, I started out by saying we had a source here, and then we had these wave fronts that were traveling in all directions. And as you heard of the picture, oh, that's a bit better job here. But what we did was to identify all of these points, all of these points that are in phase, and connected them by a line or by a surface, and that is called a wave front. In the case of the plane waves, this characterizes a wave front, where that's a constant. All of the points on that uh, are, uh, are in phase or in step with each other for that part of the wave. But for spherical systems, we have in mind characterizing these points in space by a radial distance from the, uh, say, the origin of my coordinate system by a two angular distance, theta measured from the positive z axis, going in the direction indicated here, and then projecting this radial distance into the xy plane, where this projection is r times the sum of theta is the projected distance. And measuring the angle from the x-axis to that projected line is phi by. So points in spherical space are specified not by x, y, and z, but by r, theta, and phi are points in spherical space. Now, of course, you can easily relate these two uh, from the fact that if you look carefully here, you see two right triangles. This angle is 90 degrees, so therefore this is a right triangle. This side is Z. And then when we draw parallel to the y-axis, this angle here is 90 degrees, and this is a right triangle. And therefore this is X and this is Y. So from those two right triangles, you can see the relationship here uh, between spherical and Cartesian. <coughs> From the right triangle here, we see that x is equal to, well, from the right triangle is the hotness is r times the sine of theta. And then this side here is going to be the cosine of phi. And for y, from this right triangle, y is equal to the hypotenuse r sine of theta. And then the sine of that angle, phi, like so. And then from the other right triangle, we can see that z is simply equal to r, that bottom is times um, the cosine of theta is the relationship between the spherical and Cartesian uh, points in space. <coughs> system we are referencing, everything is going to satisfy that wave equation even though in this particular case <coughs> psi is a function of r and theta and phi and t, for the points in space. Unlike the Cartesian, here it's r, theta, and phi. So that must mean that the Laplacian operator here looks different if we're working in spherical space. And indeed, the Laplacian operator in spherical space looks like this. the Laplacian operator in spherical space. 
in a calculus, you have to work hard with the transformation in order to go from Cartesian to spherical space for that Laplacian operator. But uh, there's something called the Jacobian of the transformation that gives you all the special factors that you need to get it right. You don't need to know that. I don't remember it. I took calculus uh, a century ago. So I don't remember <laughs> Stuff. But I do know where to go and look up this definition of this symbol, and that's what I do when I need to use it, and that's what I expect you to do. I don't expect you to remember anyone other than a car one more Cartesian space. That's, that's pretty simple. But for a circle space, I'll look it up when I need to use it. So, so that's the first thing. The other thing is that. I'll write this out so that since you write what I write, you'll have it written down. Fortunately, 99% of the time, the wave function that you're using in circle space <coughs> have what's called spherical symmetry. Spherical symmetry simply means that there is no angular dependence to the wave disturbance. No angular dependence to the wave disturbance means, okay, let's look here on the board. Here is the point in space we're interested in. So if there's no phi and no theta dependence, that means as theta changes from zero to pi, which is its possible range, that the wave function that's characterizing this point will be the same value for all of those points that will be mapped out in going from zero to pi. There's not going to be any difference, which is what you see. If we go from zero out to minus uh, out to pi along here where r is the same value here, uh, and all we're changing is our theta, you see we're on a wave front, and that disturbance is the same everywhere. And by the same token, if we do this now, change pi from zero to two pi, which means we're going around like this. Once again, for spherical symmetry, it means that we're here, and we're going around like that, so we're still on that spherical shell, <coughs> and therefore nothing changes. So spherical symmetry means that, uh, mathematically, we would characterize spherical symmetry by saying psi of r theta and phi and Or circle symmetry becomes only psi of r and t because it will not matter what the theta value is or the phi value is for a spherically symmetric <coughs> wave disturbance. Or another way of also indicating that is to say that. The changes in psi as we change theta will be zero. The changes in psi as we change phi will be zero for something that is spherically symmetric. So our wave equation then, now if, if there is no theta dependence, that goes away. Uh, there's no phi dependence, if there's no theta dependence, that goes away, and we're only left with this for the velocity operator. So, in this case of spherical symmetry, then our velocity operator looks like this. And when we operate, uh, use the operator to operate on a wave disturbance side. Maybe we put psi to the left of that symbol, take the derivative as shown. Taking the derivative means that, well, this is 
this partial symbol says ignore or treat the data and phi as if they're constant. And so when I take the derivative of this product, product rule, so therefore I'll have r squared times d squared psi by the r squared for one term. And for the other term, I'll have 2r d psi by the r when I use the product root. And so simplifying this then yields d squared psi by dr squared plus 2 or d psi by dr for the uh, weighting or for the Laplacian operator. And therefore, the wave equation in spherical coordinates for spherically symmetric uh, wave. <coughs> which is what you will be using 99% of the time for a surface symmetric wave is going to be d squared psi by dr squared 2 over r d squared psi by dr uh, squared d psi by dr is equal to 1 over v squared d squared psi by dt squared is what we have for the wave equation, uh, for a spherically symmetric wave. Where the wave difference for points in space is going to have an amplitude that depends on distance. So the amplitude now is not just a constant A, but it's A over R, and we'll have sine of K times R minus or plus BT plus epsilon like so. This looks awfully close to the expression we have for the plane wave, but not exactly. Here's the plane wave here. Notice that for the plane wave, we have just a constant amplitude out here. For the spherical wave, it says A over R. Here it says that the amplitude for the spherical wave decreases with distance as we go farther and farther out. A decreasing amplitude with distance suggests that the energy associated or transported with this wave disturbance is going to be proportional to 1 over r squared. Since energy it is proportional <coughs> to um, amplitude squared. The energy is proportional to amplitude squared. We square the amplitude here would be a squared or r squared. And so as we're going farther and farther away from the uh, source of the spherical wave, as we're getting farther and farther out, the energy is decreasing. as 1 over r squared. So that's one difference between that and the plane wave. The other difference here is that in the plane wave, k dot r here is going to be uh, the dot product here having k having three components, r having three components. Over here, this is not k dot r. This is k times r, where that's the magnitude and the distance. The magnitude and the distance, that's vector and vector magnitude and the distance. <laughs> On a wave front, though, on a circle wave front, K times R is going to be a constant. 
R is the same value for all points on the wavefront. K, the size of the propagation, 2 pi over lambda, if it's mono, uh, uh, monochromatic uh, wave, then lambda is a constant, too. So K times lambda is a constant for a wavefront. Uh, and so, therefore, our wave disturbance would be described. And the plus and the minus here, the minus would suggest that the wave is traveling in the direction of increasing radial distance, and the plus in the opposite direction, decreasing radial distance, wave disturbance going in towards as opposed to out. And again, the phase angle only for comparison to other waves or and furthermore, we can also do the complex representation, <coughs> psi complex, for points in spherical space. <coughs> well, we'll have the amplitude, and then we'll have e to the i, kr minus or plus dt plus epsilon. The k doesn't multiply the epsilon, so I need to put a another thing here like that. Okay. Where, if you remember Euler's formula, this is in terms of cosine of that phase and plus i times the sine of that phase. So using the sine part is where that came from. So the idea with a cylindrical wave, then, is that we have, once again, this is a wave front. Which means all the points on this wave are in phase with each other, are in step with each other. And so I'm showing here three uh, different wave fronts, although there are an infinite number of them that you can draw. In this case, the Laplacian operator, take, well, first of all, let's draw this coordinate. So x, y, and z in cylindrical space, points in cylindrical space here, instead of x, y, and z, 
it's going to be, uh, first of all, the z distance. At this point, is specified by <coughs> phi and z. And all of my courses, I always use s phi and z for cylindrical de description of points in cylindrical space. And in multivariable, and sometimes in other textbooks, they'll call this r and theta, for example. But I'm consistent because when I'm talking about spherical coordinates, theta is the angle that I reference in the xy plane. And so therefore, I want to keep that same symbol as I reference if I'm in cylindrical coordinates and not switch it over to theta, even though it's just it's arbitrary. You can call it anything you want. Uh, but I try to stay consistent. And therefore, s being the radial distance here out to this point is not the same thing as the radial distance r, which goes from the origin to the point in space. Therefore, I use this different symbol, S, for that in all of my courses. And other, uh, uh, you'll find some textbooks will be consistent and stick with this. Phi is then measured from here. So points in space and cylindrical space are characterized by radio distance from the origin in the xy plane out to where the point is projected in the xy plane. And the S distance uh, is indicated here. And then the phi angle is, as always in my case, measured from the plus x axis going counterclockwise all the way 0 to 2 pi is its variation. And then for the z parameter, it's the distance from the xy plane up to the point in cylindrical space. And so once again, if you needed to do the transformation, there is a right triangle that, is, that you can see here, the right triangle that you work with for the transformator, there's a 90 degree angle. If I go parallel to the y direction, so this is the y and this is the x, and the corresponding transformation equation then is going to be x is equal to s, the hypotenuse, times the cosine of phi, y is equal to s times the sine of phi, and z is equal to same z in Cartesian space are the transformation coordinates for cylindrical. <coughs> so the Laplacian then in this cylindrical space takes on the form 1 over s partial with respect to s of s times the partial with respect to s plus 1 over s squared partial squared with respect to phi and plus partial squared with respect to z is the form that the Laplacian takes. And again, these 1 over s and 1 over s squared and that stuff comes from the Jacobian of the transformation. All you need to know about that is that these have to make dimensionally this whole thing correct, dimensionally. So if you know that this dimension means 1 over length squared, since it's d by dx squared, 1 over length squared, each one of these terms have to be equivalent to a 1 over length squared. So here, this is dimensional. It's got this is s meters in the numerator, meters in the denominator. And here's where your s squared comes from here, not from your length squared. Here, length squared is in this term, because that has no dimension. And length squared in the z squared term. And so that's the thing that has to be kept, uh, correct and what the Jacobian transformation does for you uh, when you learn how to do that stuff in uh, calculus. So for cylindrical symmetry then, cylindrical symmetry means that points in cylindrical space which would be characterized by s phi z and <coughs> become characterized by distance only. And there is no dependence and there is no z dependence. There is no phi dependence. There is no z dependence. If you're looking up here on uh, for what I have drawn here for a wave disturbance here, if z is in this direction here, you can see that as you are going up along here, you're still on this 
one wave front, and there's no difference between the point here and the point there. The wave disturbance looks all different. To see a difference, you've got to jump over to another wave front to actually see a difference. So <laughs> those, the wave disturbance does not depend on Z. It doesn't depend on phi. Phi means going up and taking this point around here. So this is phi moving around here, and there's no phi. Difference. So cylindrical symmetry means that the wave disturbance depends only on how far the radial distance is from the origin. And so therefore, our wave equation in cylindrical space becomes There is no phi dependence, there is no z dependence, becomes L squared psi is 1 over s d by ds of s d psi by ds is, the, is equal to 1 over v squared d squared psi by d d squared is the wave equation in cylindrical space. Now comes the hard part. I already told you that 99% um, of the time when you're using uh, wave uh, curvilinear space is going to be spherical. So you are hardly ever going to run into a situation where you're asked to compute something using cylindrical wave equation. Why? Because it's very hard. <laughs> Most of you probably have not even heard of Bessel functions, but the solution to this equation are what are called Bessel functions. Solutions are Bessel functions. If you know anything about a Bessel function or have heard of a Bessel function, there are two types of Bessel functions. Just like there is a sine and a cosine, there are two types of Bessel functions uh, that end up uh, being used to represent the solutions to the wave equation. And I'll just show you a picture of a Bessel function. Say a Bessel function here which would, um, as a function of S, <coughs> Bessel function might look like this. Okay. <coughs> and so it's going to have some wiggle in it. It's going to look like, look kind of like sine and cosine stuff, but it's very complicated. And the, the first, your first encounter really with Bessel functions will be your first course in math methods in graduate school. That's where I ran into those rascals for the first time. So Bessel function. So um, you won't be doing much with this. What the saving grace with the solution to this wave equation is that for very large distances away from the source of the disturbance, that the wave function can be characterized by an amplitude all over the square root of uh, distance times the sine of ks <coughs> plus dt plus epsilon like that for very large distances away then we, the Bessel function can be approximated in this fashion. And you can see here how having this square root of s here would modulate or decrease the amplitude as you're getting farther and farther out away from the source. Or for the complex function, if we were using for calculation purposes, this complex function 
that would have an amplitude that looks like this, and we also have to have e to the i uh, k s minus plus v t plus epsilon, like so, for the weight disturbance. Getting the touch upon before we move on to chapter three here is the superposition principle. We come back to it over and over and over. Superposition principle, as it refers to addition of vectors, basically is vector addition. Finding a resultant vector. Finding a resultant vector when we have quantities that are represented by the vector simply said, okay, well, we look at all of these vectors that are interacting on some object and we come up with a resultant vector and we make the statement that, okay, the resultant vector is going to produce a certain physical action, but I also know that those very same individual vectors that went into producing that resultant will also produce that same identical action. So if I have here a situation where um, say I'm doing a displacement vector, so this is uh, displacement one, displacement two, then my net displacement is going to be this vector right here from vector addition. Then the displacement vector says final location from my starting point is right there. And so superposition says that if I do my individual vectors, I'll get one physical output. But if I forget about that and do just the equivalent of those two or the resultant, I'll get the same physical outcome. That's all the result of vector says to me. Superposition principle says that when we're talking about weight disturbances, where we have a psi 1 and a psi 2, that will need at the same point in space when they meet at the same point in space, that what happens to them is that they combine like vectors. <coughs> they combine like vectors. So we'll get a resultant disturbance when they meet at that same point in space that is going to characterize the fact that they are vectors. And of course you know the rest of the story. The rest of the story says, well, if the two are in phase with each other, if psi 1 looks like this, and psi 2 looks like this, suggesting that they are lock, stock, and barrel in step with each other in phase when they get to that point, then they are are going to combine using superposition to produce uh, a resultant disturbance that, say, if I come through here and call this the amplitude here, and through here, this is the amplitude, A1, and this is the amplitude, A2, that they'll produce a combined disturbance 
that will be constructive in nature. Namely, the resultant amplitude will be A1 plus A2 when they meet at that point. For example, if we're talking about this point right here, <coughs> or the maximum resultant amplitude would be A1 plus A2. But if they're out of phase, so if sine 1 looks like this, and psi 2 looks like this, So if they're out of phase like that, then here you see this is A1, but this is minus A2. And so when they're out of phase, then there's going to be destructive interference. Which simply means that the resultant the disturbance that you get is going to be less than what the sum would be because you're taking the difference. You're adding these wave disturbances like they are vector one, like they have a uh, plus and minus for that addition property. So that's the superposition principle. I introduced this the same superposition principle because there's a section in chapter two about phasers and how convenient it is when you have two or three or four or five wave disturbances and you've got to add them, then the phaser represents a very convenient way because it looks just like adding vectors, head to tail, head to tail, head to tail, once you construct the phasers. I'm going to skip over the phaser stuff right now and when we need it or want to use it, we'll come back and refer to it, but I simply want to tell you why it's did. Okay. All right, very good. So that takes care of that. So now what you have uh, learned so far, most importantly, what uh, the significance of a wave is, transports energy from one place to another uh, without necessarily anything having to move from one place to another. Something has to be disturbed. In the case of the waves we're interested in, it's the electric field and the magnetic field that's disturbed. We also have a wave equation that characterizes, um, gives us the physics and the mathematics behind how to calculate and predict things with these wave disturbances, the wave equation. So whether we're working with the wave equation in Cartesian space or in spherical space or in cylindrical space, we don't care. It's all the same thing. This may be a little bit more challenging to work in one space than another, but it's all the same thing. So what we are going to move, uh, uh, turn our attention to now, is the physics behind um, the optics, that is, those parts of classical electromagnetic theory that are important for understanding of objects. And that's the discussion of chapter three. Classical physics. Classical physics, we're talking about things that uh, move slowly, things that are large. We're talking about classical mechanics and electricity and magnetism is what should come to your mind when you hear the word classical, uh, classical physics. So in classical physics, light is treated
as an electromagnetic wave. Light is treated as an electromagnetic wave. The fact that we are saying wave tells us something is being disturbed. That means that the electric field Disturb is just another way of simply saying that they take on a time dependence. Means that they uh, they're going to take on a time dependence. So as we take a look at the basic laws behind classical uh, electromagnetic theory. Uh, we turn our attention to what we mean by an electric field and magnetic field. In the case of an electric field, we know that that means that we've got some net charge, some net Q here, present somewhere. And one way to view what's going on with the points in space when we've got this net Q is that there are electric field vectors associated with the various points in space. And sometimes we can draw these lines of the electro of the electric field. Idea came, that came from Michael Faraday, these lines of the electric field to help us visualize a little bit about what's going on uh, with this um, uh, with these points in space. Uh, but electric field means existence of net charge. Electric field, existence of net charge. Now, magnetic field means existence of net charge and it's in motion. So, therefore, if we got a charge here and this charge is moving, say in the direction uh, off to the right here, like so. Then that means that the lines of the magnetic field now are going to be with the right hand rule. So therefore, this is coming out of the board. This is going into the board like so. Where I curl my fingers, thumb in the direction of the charge is moving. These are the lines of the magnetic field. And so if this is moving at a constant V, the line Lines of B or B itself associated with the points in space will have no time dependence if it's moving at a constant B. If this is not moving, D will have no time dependence. However, if, if this is moving, then not only does E take on a time dependence, because the charge is over here now, a different distance from that point. So not, if that's moving, not only does the E here, due to the existence of the net Q, take on a time dependence, but B will also have a time dependence if it's moving non-state, if it's accelerating, start, stop, start, stop, or herky-jerky, or whatever the case may be. We'll pick up from here next time and continue on with basic laws of this. Hey.